Investing can be risky, but there are some ways to minimize that risk. And here to talk with me about that is Hannah Sarzuski from Blue Mountain Financial Planning. Hannah, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Pleasure to have you. You just wrote an article about this very topic for Retirement Daily. We're eager to have you uh, walk us through it. Where to begin? Yes. And so we'll just be addressing some risks that we can avoid, uh, possible red flags, and um, so just looking at different ways to be more successful with investing. Right. So one of the key things that people need to understand is that there's a relationship between um, risk and reward. Uh, tell us about that. Yes. There's a correlation between the amount of risk you take and your expected return. So if you want higher returns, you have to take more risk. And, um, and so this takes us to risk capacity. Risk capacity is the amount of risk you can afford to take. And what I mean by that is if things go poorly, how much can you afford to lose without it being detrimental to your financial plan? Mm. And so I just like to point out that it's possible to take too much risk and expose your portfolio to too much risk. So- Hannah, in the article, you also mentioned that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Yes. Uh, so there are many investments, for example, online that advertise spectacular outcomes, high returns, but they don't address risk. And so I just want to acknowledge that there's really not a magical solution where you're going to get super low risk and high returns. And so just to be aware that if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Right. So one of the risks that you mentioned in the article is illiquidity. Talk about that. Sure. So there are many investments that reduce your liquidity. For example, precious metals, real estate, hedge funds, private equity. Um, and liquidity is a risk. Um, illiquidity. And that's because you may not have access to your money for extended periods of time, or you may have to sell at a discount to have access to your money. So when you give up liquidity and increase your risk, you should expect a premium or a higher return for the extra risk that you're taking. And in today's environment, in many cases, that premium may not transpire. And so you're taking extra risk that you may not be compensated for. Um, and then it would have been better off to invest in a diversified stock and bond portfolio. Um, you know, your outcome might be the same or better net of fees and you'd have less risk. Right. So in your article, you mentioned that one way to manage or mitigate the risk of investing is to understand what you're investing in. Tell us about that, too. Yes. Um, and so some investments are really complicated <laughs> and the salespeople selling them may not even be able to fully explain how they work. Um, and so these investments typically have more risk. And in some cases, the complexity does not favor the investor. And so um, you absolutely should be able to understand how your investments are making money. And it's important to recognize that complexity does not equal sophistication. And so in reality, these investments could just be a red flag. They may be something you want to consider. So in the article, you also mentioned um, a phrase that many people are familiar with, risk tolerance. What do they need to know about that? Risk tolerance is the amount of risk you can take without losing sleep at night. And what I mean by that is if the markets are doing poorly for extended periods of time, are you okay with the risk in your portfolio? So for example, if the markets are down for a year and your returns have not rebounded, and then let's say another year goes by, and then a third year and your returns still have not recovered, are you tempted to sell your stocks at a low point and get out of the market? And if you are tempted to do that, um, then that may be an indicator that your risk tolerance or that the risk you're taking is not aligned with your portfolio. So it would have been better to take slightly less risk and stay in the market rather than locking in that permanent loss. Right. What about overconcentration? That's a term that people may have heard but may not know much about. Sure. Overconcentration is when your overall portfolio is comprised um, 
a large portion of your overall portfolio is comprised of one individual stock or bond. And so ideally, you don't want one company to be more than 5% and then 10% it gets more serious. Um, and so a lot can happen to one company. And if you're over-concentrated in that company, that can directly impact your investments and that investment may not recover. And so this is a risk that does not pay off and the solution is diversification. Right. And there can also be risk in being too conservative, too safe. Sure. Um, and so it is possible to be too conservative and there's still risk in that. And so if you have a bunch of cash under the mattress, um, that is not going to keep up with inflation. And so, for example, right now we have a higher inflation and your dollar could be losing value. And so um, that impacts your future purchasing power. And so, again, there's just there's still risk even in that. Hmm. So obviously this is a uh, not an exhaustive list of risks. Uh, we've already covered a lot of ground. Anything that we missed or anything that just bears reemphasizing? And so. I think understanding that you can't eliminate risk and have no risk, but the type of risk you take is important. And so we can avoid unnecessary risk. We can pay attention to red flags and have better success with our investing outcome. And this really matters when we're talking about meaningful goals like retirement or your children's college costs. Mm. And I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with our readers and our viewers. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. 